a legendary hero makes an amazing escape. An innocent man takes revenge on his accusers. And a determined toy maker battles to save Christmas. But first, a loveless marriage, a secret affair, and an angry ghost all come together at this enchanting location. More than 100 miles southwest of Paris is the stunning Loire Valley. It's really considered one of those beautiful regions. On the river, royal castles have been built through the centuries. One of the finest castles to dot the landscape is the Chateau de Brissac. Famously referred to as the giant of the Loire Valley, the building looms over 130 acres of parkland and vineyards. It's a medieval fortress, and it's really famous for its height. It's known as the tallest castle of France, with its seven stories. The corners of the castle are marked by imposing 11th century towers, while the facade is designed in a more ornate Renaissance style. There's no two castles that look like Brissac because of this. Inside, gilded ceilings, beautiful paintings, and a collection of lavish furniture create a stunning decor. It has 204 rooms. I'd say the most special would probably be the theater. But this refined and serene dwelling holds a dark secret. The Chateau de Brissac is haunted. I actually had a personal experience. When I first arrived, I heard a very, very stark kind of a shriek. It was a voice that was being tortured or murdered. I was terrified. So what chilling tale lies within the Chateau de Brissac? Jacques de Brézé, the owner of the Chateau de Brissac, is a violent, brash aristocrat. Jacques de Brézé was a bit of a barbarian, one might say. Very highly strung, a hot-tempered type of person. His wife is the elegant Charlotte de Brézé. As the half-sister of the king, she is the epitome of grace and refinement. She was known for her beauty. She had long hair and chose the color green for her clothes because she thought it would really offset her beauty. The marriage is not a happy one. Jacques was a very keen huntsman. His wife, having been brought up in the court, was just not very compatible with him. Accustomed to a pampered lifestyle, Charlotte finds herself ignored by her temperamental husband. Lonely and starved of attention, she seeks affection elsewhere. She went off with somebody else. But Charlotte's illicit affair won't remain a secret for long. One night in 1477, Jacques is sleeping in his bedroom and all of a sudden, his attendant runs in. The servant tells Jacques that Charlotte is in bed with another man. Enraged by the news, Jacques prepares to confront the adulterous couple and storms off to Charlotte's chamber. While no one knows for sure what happens next, Charlotte and her lover are never seen alive again. News of the puzzling disappearance spreads into town and rumors quickly begin to swirl. Some speculate that perhaps the beautiful Charlotte was murdered by none other than her jealous and brutal husband. Probably with his hot temper, didn't hesitate when he saw his lovely wife in the hands of this other man. When Charlotte's half-brother, the King of France, finds out that his sister is missing, he's outraged. Louis XI was furious and he demanded the imprisonment and the trial of Jacques de Brézé. Not long after, Jacques is tried and convicted of murdering his wife. He was sent to prison, and he was meant to have a life sentence. But just a few years later, the king dies. Jacques appeals to the new monarch, and after paying a heavy fine, is able to secure his own release. He only had a few years of imprisonment. It seems as if the murderous Jacques has escaped justice. But when he returns home, he finds something sinister is waiting for him. Jacques was very disturbed by voices. Moans and screams echo through the castle. And roaming the halls is a ghostly apparition cloaked in green. It seems Charlotte is enforcing her own brand of justice from beyond the grave. The specter of his dead wife is too much for Jacques to handle. And soon after, the chateau is sold off to the Brissac family. It's been in the Brissac family ever since 1502 till today. Visitors to the castle still claim to see the unquiet spirit of Charlotte de Brissac as she cries out for revenge. We have people who feel her presence in Brissac and see a lady in a green dress flip by. 
her tragic and ghastly tale lives on within the great walls of this extravagant castle. A war-torn nation, a Christmas without presents, and a man on a mission all culminate in the creation of this opulent New England estate. The historic metropolis of New Haven, Connecticut, lies on the banks of Long Island Sound. New Haven is one of the oldest cities in America. It's probably best known for being home to Yale University. But just outside the city is a spectacular hidden gem. This is Marldine Mansion. When I look at this mansion, the first thing that comes to mind is the old world Europe. It seems transported from another place at another time. Built in 1921, the stunning country estate has an air of refinement and grandeur. Lots of detail, especially on the windows and the roof. The mansion almost looks like a movie set. But this serene dwelling is the product of a tumultuous time, an era few children could ever forget. This mansion tells the story of one man's journey to save a beloved American tradition. <laughs> 27-year-old Alfred Gilbert is an entrepreneur who makes his living selling magic kits to kids. One day, while riding the train to New York, he spies something that will change his life forever. He sees all of this construction going on, these steel girders and massive machines and huge, huge, huge pieces of equipment. Gilbert is fascinated by the intricate mechanics, and suddenly he gets an idea. Now, a lot of us, we look at construction and we don't give it a second thought, but this guy thinks... This looks like fun. This might even inspire children. So he resolves to mimic the machinery in miniature and make a toy. That night, he gets to work on his idea. He starts chopping up little pieces of cardboard in the thin slices that resemble the construction apparatuses he saw. And then he tinkers with them until they all fit together. The result is a series of beams and bolts that children can assemble. Then, as his paper prototype takes shape, he decides to utilize a stronger material for the toy's creation. He hired a machinist to turn it into little metal pieces that could be uniformly snapped together into much larger construction sets. That made it stronger, more durable, more fun. Finally, he gives his invention a new name, the Gilbert Erector Set. In 1913, he debuts his creation at the New York Toy Fair. Gilbert was a showman, a marketer, so when it's time to show off his toy, he did it with pizzazz. The Erector set starts selling right away, and before long, business is booming. Millions of people are buying his toy. He can't even make these things fast enough. Just two years after he unveils the Erector set to the world, it is a certified smash hit. But then, in April 1917, the sky comes crashing down on Gilbert's creation and the children who love it. Almost overnight, the entire world changes. The United States officially enters World War I, and factories like Gilbert's are needed for the war effort. When you look at what goes into making an erector set, it's remarkably similar to what goes into making the vital tools needed on the front lines in Europe. So America's Council of National Defense soon considers a drastic ban on all toy production. Worse still, the holidays are approaching. Americans were looking at the very real prospect of a Christmas without toys. Gilbert supports the war effort, but he believes toys are too important to give up. Gilbert looked at toys, and he saw not just business, but a huge opportunity to educate. He has this firm belief that toys were necessary to shape America's youth. So he vows to find a way to save Christmas. It's 1917, and the demands of World War I have led America's Council of National Defense to propose a ban on toy production right before the holidays. But the inventor of the Erector set, Alfred Gilbert, believes toys are too important to give up. Determined to convince the council to reverse their decision, he bands together with other industry leaders. So the toy manufacturers appoint Gilbert to testify that toys had to stay, that they were important, that they served a greater good. Then, the resolute Gilbert travels to a council meeting in Washington, D.C. So Gilbert shows up, and he's told he has just a couple of minutes to make his case. The toy maker knows that convincing the austere leaders won't be easy. So he brings out a secret weapon, the Erector Set. 
When these toys are handed out, it's almost like you can feel the atmosphere in the room change. Suddenly, these stodgy men in suits and ties almost turn into kids again. They remember what toys meant to them and what toys probably mean to their children. It's one of those moments that kind of lives on in legend. Gilbert convinces them that toys weren't just a good thing, they were a necessary thing. America's Council of National Defense is persuaded, and they drop their proposal. Toy production continues through December. Across the nation, newspaper headlines herald Gilbert as the man who saved Christmas. That Christmas, millions of children wake up to bounties of presents, including A.C. Gilbert's erector set, because of his testimony. By 1935, Gilbert has sold more than 30 million kits. With a success, he builds the stunning Marlene Mansion. He continues to make toys until his death in 1961. And today, Marlene Mansion stands as a monument to the inventor who will forever be known as the man who saved Christmas. Treachery, doomed love, and revenge come together in a work of literary genius. And it all played out within the walls of one of Europe's most ominous prisons. Among the mighty alpine peaks of northern Italy lies the mountain town of Fenestrel. The quaint village is dwarfed by the structure that rises high above, Fenestrel Fort. Situated 6,000 feet above sea level, it is one of the largest strongholds in Europe. If you put the Empire State Building on top of the Eiffel Tower, that would give you an image of just how big it is. Completed in 1850, this monumental structure covers 320 acres and stretches over two miles long. Fenestrel is often termed the Great Wall of the Alps. The complex is comprised of multiple buildings, including barracks, powder magazines, and even a church. Its most distinctive feature is a stairway with nearly 4,000 steps. But a stronghold this large would be incomplete without a prison. This one is so formidable, it was called the Siberia of Italy. You can only imagine the cold, damp, miserable existence of a prisoner lost to the world entirely. It was within these foreboding walls that one inmate hatched a chilling plot of retribution and murder. He had plenty of time to think about how he was going to get even. Pierre Picot is a young shoemaker of humble means. But the impoverished Frenchman is rich in love. Captivated by a Parisian woman named Marguerite, the cobbler proposes and she accepts. She is not only beautiful, she comes from a higher social station and will have a large dowry to bring with her. Ecstatic, Picot heads off to a local bar to celebrate with some friends, including the establishment's owner, Lupian. Picot announces the great news to the bar owner, Lupian, and two of his friends. And then, having drunk his fill, Picot leaves the bar and rushes off to get on with his plans for the wedding. But the joyous occasion is short-lived. Soon after, without any warning, Picot is arrested. And before he knows why, he's being whisked off to the grim fortress of Fenestrel. Once imprisoned, the baffled Picot discovers he's been accused of a heinous crime, spying. The Napoleonic France had been at war with England since the early 1790s, and so that was a really grave accusation to make. Picot is helpless against the false claim. It's difficult to imagine a worse fate. He's been taken away from the woman he loves without any knowledge of who has accused him. Furious, Picot vows to take revenge on those responsible for ruining his life. Despite his bleak situation, a sliver of hope emerges when Picot meets a fellow prisoner named Father Torre. The elderly priest takes a liking to Picot and makes him an offer that will change everything. He claims he has a secret fortune. Then he tells Picot he can have it. They told him where that treasure that he had amassed had been hidden. The cobbler is stunned. With these riches, he can reinvent himself and take revenge on those who put him behind bars. Finally, in 1814, after seven long years at Fenestrel, Picot is set free. On his release from prison, Picot is a changed man in every sense. Long gone is the once humble shoemaker. In his place is a man determined to reclaim his lost love and quench his thirst for justice by any means necessary. It's 1814 in Italy, when humble shoemaker Pierre Picot is falsely accused of spying. He loses everything, 
including his beloved fiance. Now, after seven years in prison, he has only one thing on his mind. Revenge. He heads off immediately to Milan, where he starts to get his hands onto the wealth that had been bequeathed him by his old friend, Torre. With the secret treasure, he forges a new identity as a nobleman and heads for Paris. There, Pico discovers in horror that his troubles all stem from that fateful night in the cafe. It seems the bar owner, Lupion, was also in love with Marguerite. Resentful of Pico's good fortune, he and two friends plotted to sabotage the engagement. It wasn't some accident. It was deliberate by those he thought were his friends and who he could trust. But the worst news is still to come. While Pico has been in prison, Lupien has married Marguerite. For Pico, this is the last straw. He kills Lupion's first accomplice, leaving behind an ominous warning. On the dagger is written, number one. Then, Pico systematically continues his rampage, poisoning the second accomplice and burning Lupion's cafe to the ground. Lupion lost nearly all his possessions in the conflagration. With the co-conspirators dead and Lupion's livelihood ruined, Pico's vendetta is almost complete. He has just one last target, Lupion himself. One night, Pico intercepts his betrayer. It forces Lupien to remember the events of 1807 and stabs him in the heart, killing him instantly. With the score finally settled, Pico longs to return to his Marguerite. But once more, fate intervenes. One of Lupion's friends takes Pico by surprise. He strikes him, killing Pico. It's an unusual end to this remarkable tale of murder and revenge. Over time, this epic saga of love, suffering, and avengement is told and retold, ultimately finding its way to the great French author, Alexander Dumas. In 1844, the inspired writer immortalizes the life of Pierre Picot in his infamous adventure, The Count of Monte Cristo. The novel becomes a landmark in Western literature, spawning numerous films and capturing the imagination of millions. Today, the imposing Fenestrel Fortress still stands high above the Alps, a reminder of the man who spent seven years of his life plotting revenge, spawning a story for the ages. A popular brew creates havoc throughout London in one of the most bizarre disasters of all time. Caught in the middle of it all is the businessman whose lasting legacy is this regal home. Around 10 miles outside of London is the bustling town of Chesant, it's really old and cute. There's a 15th century church and a beautiful public library. But the jewel in the crown of this borough is this remarkable property, Theobald's House. So Theobald's House is an absolutely stunning Georgian mansion. It's the sort of place that you dream about living in. The 18th century red brick building is adorned with radiant white stone accents and overlooks 55 acres of sprawling parkland and gardens. The front facade is topped off with eight symmetrical chimneys. It's got these beautiful arched windows which make it look so elegant. The manor's interior is equally as striking. There's a stunning boardroom with carved figures on the walls and an amazing spiral staircase winds through the mansion. But this extravagant dwelling conceals a strange and tumultuous past. This manor is linked to one of the most bizarre disasters in British history. One of the weirdest things ever to happen in central London. Henry Mew is a young, ambitious entrepreneur. He came from a very affluent family. He was rich, he was privileged. But Henry wants to succeed on his own merits. So he resolves to purchase his own business and identifies a promising field. Craft Ales. Beer was a growing industry, and porters were the new drink of choice. But porters aren't easy to create. They require a lengthy aging period of up to 10 months. Huge bats were needed to help the maturing process. So Henry sets his sights on what seems like the perfect spot, London's Horseshoe Brewery. Situated on the roof of the building are wooden bats reinforced with outer metal rings. The largest is a 22-foot-tall behemoth that holds over 128,000 gallons of liquid. They were stacked close together to maximize space and quantity. Confident that these vats are the ticket to a success, 
Henry raids his savings and buys the horseshoe. And sure enough, business quickly takes off. Henry has struck gold. He'd taken a good ground and was propelling it forward. But his promising future is swiftly brought to a grinding halt when unexpectedly, disaster strikes. It's October 1814, and the people of London are finishing work, meeting people, having a pleasant evening. Then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, comes this immense noise. And the source of the sound is the Horseshoe Brewery. The walls of the Horseshoe are crashing down into the streets, which are suddenly filled with this foamy, dark substance. The mysterious dark fluid is Henry's beer, and enormous waves of it are gushing through the streets of London. It's almost impossible to imagine. People are running for their lives. It was a tsunami of beer. The ludicrous sight is something to behold, but it's not without a dark side. This incident only lasted for a few minutes, but it left devastating debris in its path. Buildings were destroyed, dozens of people were injured, and eight people died. When Henry finds out, he's beside himself. Henry is devastated. He wants to know what's happened. So what caused this foam-filled tidal wave? It's 1814 in London. Brewer Henry Mew is aghast when a tidal wave of his beer wreaks disaster upon London. But what caused the tsunami of suds? A committee was formed to get to the root of what happened to establish if Henry was culpable for this disaster. Slowly, they piece together the origins of the fateful event. It seems one of the metal rings holding the largest vat together slipped and fell off. The other rings couldn't contain the beer on its own, so the pressure built up and bang went the beer. Then the exploded vat instigated a domino effect with the surrounding containers. One vat knocked over another, which knocked over another, and in the end they lost eight to nine thousand barrels of beer. In the wake of these findings, the investigative committee reaches a verdict. The judge decided that it was an act of God, a freak accident, and Henry was cleared of any culpability. But the reprieve is short-lived. The brewery lies in ruins, and Henry is facing financial disaster. He lost in today's money the staggering $66 million. The loss of all that beer put Henry on the verge of bankruptcy. Still, the entrepreneur is determined to return his business to its former glory. Henry painstakingly repairs the brewery and makes sure that the new vats are safe and secure. Over time, Henry painstakingly digs himself out of debt. And by 1820, the brewery is, once again, a success. By this point, Henry spends his hard-earned money on Theobald's house. He continues to run the horseshoe until his death in 1841. The brewery stayed in great shape until 1921, when it finally closed its doors for good. But the strange event of 1814 is never forgotten. What's left of the Horseshoe's legacy is the remarkable home of its former owner. The lavish Theobald's house serves as a testament to one man's dedication to overcome a bizarre yet tragic event. A legendary outlaw, a villainous sheriff, and an epic escape. It all plays out on the grounds of this stunning castle. Strategically located in the center of England, the city of Nottingham once served as a key supply point on the route between London and Scotland. Dominating the landscape atop a 130-foot sandstone cliff is Nottingham Castle. It's a place of different moods. It's incredibly imposing. Surrounded by expansive emerald lawns, the commanding stone structure rises to three stories. The roof has a series of pillars creating a balcony around the outside, which gives the castle an extra romantic appeal. Originally erected in the 11th century, the palace was rebuilt in 1674. Today, there is little left of the medieval stone edifice. The most impressive structure that we have remaining is the gatehouse, which consists of two large towers surrounding the entrance to the castle. These looming sentinels are linked to a legend that is known the world over. This castle holds secrets and tales which will delight everyone. The tale begins with the powerful and corrupt sheriff of Nottingham, who has been collecting oppressive taxes from the local villagers. All the while, he leads a life of luxury at his fortified castle. But one man dares to challenge the villainous sheriff. A 
a kind-hearted bandit who goes by the name Robin Hood. Robin Hood becomes an outlaw to fight for truth and justice. From his base in nearby Sherwood Forest, he and his gang of noble outlaws, called the Merry Men, and ambush rich visitors en route to the castle. He stole from the rich and gave to the poor. Everybody loves the man who stands up for the little guy. Enraged by the mischief maker's growing popularity, the lawman decides he must be crushed. The sheriff sees himself undermined, and he's going to come down incredibly heavily just to retain his own sense of power. But despite every effort, the sheriff fails to track down the fugitive. Frustrated, he decides he's going to lay a trap to lure the troublemaker in. And he thinks he's got the perfect snare. An archery competition. Robin Hood is the expert archer. And the sheriff knows Robin won't be able to resist this. It's very difficult for Robin not to try and prove he's the best. Once Robin shows himself at the fortified castle, the sheriff's men will seize him. The day of the competition dawns, and the malevolent lawman is certain he will finally outwit the rebel. The sheriff is doing his best to look cool, calm, and collected. He's set his guards all the way around, and he's pretty confident that Robin Hood will turn up. But as the competition progresses, there is no sign of the wily Robin. The sheriff is livid. It looks like his trap has failed to entice the bandit. He irritably watches as the field is whittled down to just two men. The first is one of the finest archers in the land. The second, a mysterious one-eyed stranger. The first archer draws back on his bow, loses. The arrow flies. It is an absolutely perfect shot in the dead center of the target. The shot appears to be unbeatable. Nevertheless, the remaining archer steps forward to take his turn. The sheriff and crowd watch with bated breath as he takes aim and releases. His arrow not only heads directly to the center of the target, but hits the end of the previous archer's arrow, splitting the arrow in half. The sheriff realizes whoever has done that shot is no ordinary archer. This is Robin Hood. With his disguise, Robin has outwitted the spiteful Nottingham. He has completely humiliated the sheriff, not only in front of just the people of Nottingham, but everybody who's come from far and wide as well. Furious, the lawman shouts for his guards. But before they can reach the outlaw, he's escaped once again. Irate, the sheriff sends his men out in pursuit. He wants to make sure that once and for all he's going to crush Robin Hood. And not long after, he finally gets his man. Elated, the nefarious lawman confines the noble bandit to the dreary dungeons of Nottingham Castle. The sheriff is feeling absolutely on top of the world. There's no way that Robin Hood can possibly escape now. Those dungeons are impregnable. It seems this is the end for the hero, Robin Hood. It's the 12th century, and according to legend, the Sheriff of Nottingham has finally captured his nemesis, the outlaw, Robin Hood. The heroic rebel is now behind bars in the seemingly impenetrable dungeon of Nottingham Castle. But he is far from alone in his quest for justice. Robin's merry men are determined to break their leader out of prison, and they know just how to do it. There are tunnels going all the way from the top of Castle Rock to ground level, and then spreading out underneath the city for miles around. The merry men use the tunnels to sneak into the castle, and indeed to get into the dungeons themselves. Once inside the prison, they overpower the guards. Then, they set an elated Robin free. He's now able to sneak back again down through those tunnels and then they sneak over the river uh, and back into the safety of Sherwood Forest. When the sheriff learns of the escape, he is incensed. Outwitted yet again, he redoubles his efforts to capture the rebel to no avail. Robin remains a free man. He becomes a popular figurehead amongst the dispossessed, amongst the oppressed. Throughout the ages, the story of Robin Hood is told and retold. So much so, that separating fact from fiction becomes nearly impossible. While some scholars say he was a real 13th century fugitive named Robert Hood, others name him as Robert of Loxley, a 12th century knight. But the true origins of this popular legend remain obscure. The fact is that Robin Hood is every man. He can be any one of us. Today, Nottingham Castle continues to serve as a link to the epic tale of Robin Hood and the lasting legacy of his rebellious ways. Tragedy turns to triumph when a sudden death inspires a communications revolution. And it 
all culminates at this sumptuous estate. In 1788, New York state leaders met in the city of Poughkeepsie to ratify the U.S. Constitution and join the United States of America. Today, in the heart of this historic town is a verdant gem, Locust Grove. The first time I saw the mansion was a big surprise. It's a very grand house. Surrounded by nearly 200 acres of lawns and gardens, this villa is designed in the Italianate style. There's arches over the carriage entrance, a huge Tuscan tower of four stories, and a color palette of very neutral tones. Gives the feel of a villa in the Italian countryside. Completed in 1852, this sprawling home contains a total of 45 rooms, including a large dining wing and a richly decorated music room. It has high ceilings, decorative plaster moldings, and it's a large, bright room. But these opulent surroundings belie the tribulation its owner once overcame. This guy was down on his luck, but he managed to drastically change the world. An up-and-coming artist is visiting the capital to complete a much-needed commission. His name is Samuel Morse. Morse had trained at one of the preeminent painting schools. He was very talented, but he had a very irregular income, and money was almost always a great concern. A family man, the 33-year-old has left his pregnant wife at home in Connecticut. Morse loved his wife very much, and I think the time that they had to spend apart was very difficult. But one day in February, the artist received some earth-shattering news. Morse got a terribly surprising letter from New Haven telling him that after the birth of their child, his wife had died. The letter is dated days earlier. It took a number of days for a message to travel between Connecticut and Washington, D.C. on horseback. Morse races off in shock to hold a funeral for his beloved. But when he arrives in Connecticut, another brutal piece of news greets him. She'd already been buried. Devastated, he blames the days-long lag in communications for not allowing him to say goodbye to his wife. Morse was incredibly upset. He'd already missed so much of their life together that missing the final end when he should have been there was a crushing blow for him. Determined to prevent others from experiencing the same distress, he vows to create a device that will enable people to communicate over long distances instantaneously. With a family to support, Morse continues to paint. But over the years, he devotes more and more of his free time to his experimental machine. Morse's idea was that two independent operators working with two sets of machines could communicate over long distances over a wire. By 1834, he begins constructing a prototype. Morse's prototype for his invention was cobbled together out of bits and pieces from his studio. The most important parts were a battery and electromagnet. Morse sinks large amounts of his time and effort into his invention. But months of hard work proved frustrating. Morse was unpleasantly surprised to discover that his initial prototype could only send a message about 40 feet. Morse is distraught. He's out of ideas, and he fears his dream of honoring his wife's memory may never come to fruition. He really had nothing to show for his invention. He didn't know what to do. It's 1834, and painter Samuel Morse is devastated after receiving word of his wife's death too late to attend her funeral. Determined to save others from a similar fate, he attempts to create a machine that will rapidly send messages long distance over a wire. But after months of tinkering, his prototype can only relay correspondence a mere 40 feet. Frustrated, Morse turns to a friend, a chemistry professor, for suggestions. The new expert studies Morse's device, and eventually he reaches a conclusion. A lack of power was the big problem. Inspired, the two remedy the issue by increasing the strength of the battery and magnet. To test the device, they loop an enormous wire, measuring a third of a mile around the lecture hall. Then, they turn on the machine and launch an electrical pulse. Amazingly, the message reached the other end of the wire. Morse was thrilled. This was a huge step forward for his apparatus and a validation of his system. But the device still only conveys electrical pulses. Morse had to figure out how to actually communicate information over a wire. So he designs an ingenious solution, a new alphabet. Morse assigns each letter based on the gaps between bursts of electricity. Shorter and longer bursts stood for basically what we call today dots and dashes. And finally, the inventor's work is complete. Morse's machine almost immediately became called the telegraph, and his alphabet was called the Morse code. In 1843, the inventor receives government financing to build a telegraph line from Washington to Baltimore. And it causes a sensation. 
It was such a new and incredible change in technology that everyone was amazed. As soon as people started using his new invention, they couldn't imagine life without it. The technology revolutionizes the manner in which people communicate, honoring the memory of Morse's beloved. In the new interconnected world, nobody would have to suffer the same agonies that Morse had after his wife passed away. In the wake of his success, the artist turned inventor reaps tremendous financial rewards. And the erstwhile renter is finally able to build his own home in Poughkeepsie, New York. He calls it Locust Grove. But today, this ornate mansion is also fondly known as the house the Telegraph built.